But there is a, a principle, a teaching in the, in the Talmud that goes something like this. We will never in our lifetimes finish all the things that we need to or want to. But that should not prevent us from continuing to bear the burden of doing our very best. And that's how I feel about Utah State University. We're not going to be able to create the university of our dreams in a 10-year period or even in a 20-year period. It's something that we're going to have to depend on future generations to do for us. But we can lay a foundation and we can build on the shoulders of those who have gone before. And that is our obligation and our great opportunity. And that's what I hope to do during the time that I'm here uh, serving with you as, as dean. And, and I hope eventually to stay on as a member of the faculty after my time as dean is done and, and teach here. We're trying to build something truly great. And I'll just share with you um, a little anecdote that makes that point. Although I was born here in Logan, I was raised in Southern California, and I went from grade school to my first year of college uh, in California. My father was a member of the faculty uh, at the University of Southern California in the area of public administration. And I can remember as a young boy uh, that I didn't get an opportunity to see my dad as often as either he or I would like. And so sometimes on Saturdays when he would go into the office, we lived in the Pasadena area. And those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles know that uh, USC is, is down in the middle of Los Angeles. So on Saturdays, uh, Dad would take me in with him to his office. And I would work on my projects while he was working on his projects. And I'd steal uh, sugar cubes out of the secretary's coffee preparations. And uh, we, had, we had some great times together in those days. Well, just a year ago, my wife Kathy and I went down to USC, where our daughter Emily had just finished her master's degree in occupational therapy. And we were there for the commencement. And the commencement took place on the plaza outside of Bovard Hall, which is the chief administration office, where my father had his uh, office, and across the plaza to Doheny Library. And there were about 15,000 people there, I think, that day. The commencement proceeded out of the colonnades of the Bovard Hall and across the plaza towards the Doheny Library, led by the president of the faculty senate, who was carrying the university's mace, leading the, uh, the procession. As I sat there and noticed the procession coming out with the, with the university mace, all of a sudden I realized that it had been 50 years since my father had done the very same thing had led the university's commencement uh, parade, carrying that university uh, mace. And all of a sudden, I came to grips with the fact that I now can think in terms of 50-year chunks. That's the first time in my life that I've ever been able to do that. You know, to identify with a beginning and an end surrounding 50 years. And I began, therefore, to think about all the things that had taken place at USC in the last 50 years. And I saw the decades coming at me, just like that. 50 years of progress at that university. I can tell you that USC was a good university 50 years ago, but it's a great university today. And they are achieving even greater levels of, of excellence with each passing year. But it doesn't happen all at once. It happens in decades. And that's what's going to be the case for us. We're a good university here today, and we've got a very fine uh, business program. But we have a destiny of greatness, and that's what we're, uh, we're all about. That's the foundation that we are laying here uh, at the Huntsman School of Business. And you are a part of that. And one of you may be, be back here as a professor or as a dean someday, and you'll be building on the platform that we've we built on. Now what was interesting to me as I had those reflections is I'll bet you not very many people remember the names of the deans of the first decade and the second decade and the third decade and the fourth decade and the fifth decade. But that's not important. What's important is the quality of the programs and offerings that are created and the transformation that can take place 
in the lives of the individuals who are there. You will go through a great transformation while you're here at Utah State University. This place will imprint on you, and it will make a huge difference in your life. And you will have an opportunity to give back and share with others uh, as a result. And you're going to feel really, really good about doing that. I want to just share with you a little bit about the vision we have for the school so you can know where we're trying to take uh, your school. Uh, we want you to be fully invested in it. We want you to be fully engaged with it. And we think you need to have an idea of where we're headed uh, so that you can do that. We call it our Vision 2020 because we're looking at the year 2020 as a way, to, as, a, as a milestone on this long journey that we're all about. First of all, I wanted to share with you some concepts about vision that I think you'll find useful not only in thinking about this university, but in thinking about organizations generally. If you think about visionary organizations, and this is the work of Collins and Forrest, you can break it down into two elements, guiding philosophy on the one hand and tangible image on the other hand. Guiding philosophy is a source of constancy in organizations. But organizations also need to be able to change. So you have this dynamic relationship between tradition and innovation, between that which is constant and that which must uh, change, that needs to be managed very, very effectively. We need to have, if you will, a kind of a north star that we are always guiding after, where we're always sort of headed, and that we don't change uh, and, and respond to that. But just like a sailor or, uh, out on the, on the ocean that might get knocked back and forth by the waves and the wind, they have to also be able to think and respond uh, over time to, the, to their environment. So there has to be a tangible image of that guiding philosophy at any one uh, point in time so that you are connected with reality and that you're not just dreaming about what might be, but you also are dealing with what really is. So what comprises guiding philosophy? Well, it's really two things. First and foremost, it's core beliefs and values, which answers the question, what do you stand for? And secondly, it's purpose, which answers the question, what is that deep and abiding human need you exist to serve? Now, universities are tapping into a very, very core uh, human need. I heard not too long ago that there are something like 82 institutions in the world that are 500 years or older. How many of them do you think are universities? <coughs> Small number or a big number? Big number, yeah, it's a big number. Somebody's around seven or something like that. What do you think the rest of them are? Religion, churches, yeah. Why is that? Because these are organizations that are connected with some of the most powerful and deep and abiding human needs that exist. Well, what about tangible image? What is that comprised of? Well, again, two things. Mission, or the most important stretch goal of the organization exists to serve at any point in time. Collins, of course, calls that BHAG. BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals. And vivid description which answers the question of what will it look like and what will it feel like when we have accomplished our mission. So a great example of the mission is the one that President Kennedy gave with respect to the space mission. Put a man on the surface of the moon before the end of this decade and return him safely to Earth. Fabulous mission, stretch goal, something that had never happened before, something that was bold, audacious, that caused people to get excited and energized around uh, and yet something that in fact was achievable. So what do we have as our organizational vision? First of all, I want you to just think about two hands stretching a rubber band for a moment. And on the bottom hand, you've got current reality. And on the top hand, you've got aspiration. If I stretch the rubber band too far, what happens? It breaks. And then what function does the rubber band play? None. It's gone. If I don't stretch the rubber band, at all, what function is the rubber band playing? Again, none. So there's an optimal stretch between where we are and where we want to be. Leaders need to get that stretch right. That's one of the great roles of leaders, is to be able to understand how much stretch they can place in the organization. And both things are important. We need to confront reality, but we also need to dream about what isn't yet, but what might, uh, in fact, be. So what is strategy? Strategy is a set of activities that are going to take us from our current 
reality to our future aspiration. They're a bridge, if you will, between where we are today and where we need to go. Uh, it defines what we will do and what we won't do. In fact, one of the most important things you need to know about strategy is that strategy means saying no as well as saying yes. You don't really have a strategy unless you can say what you're not going to do as well as what you are going to do. Uh, some of the elements of a strategy statement are uh, objective, scope, and advantage. The objective says where you're headed. That's the overall goal. That's the high impact uh, 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 vision that you have. Scope establishes those boundaries of where you're going to play. And advantage answers the question, how are you going to win? Uh, so objective, scope, and advantage need to be part of a, a great strategy statement. Now here's an attempt to begin to think about our strategy for the Huntsman School. First of all, our, our goal, our objective, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to become top tier in our chosen niche within 10 years. Now when I say our chosen niche, we have to define that rather carefully because we're not talking about becoming Harvard. Uh, in 10 years. I was back talking with the dean of uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania not too long ago, and he said, we've got people coming to us from all over the world, especially from places like India and China, and they'll say things like, we've got $50 million and we want to establish a world-class business school. And we will say to them, come back to us when you've got $500 million or $600 million. and then we can realistically talk about how you can build a world-class business school. So we have to be very careful and very focused in terms of the niche that we've chosen to be top tier in. Uh, at the center of our circle is what we call our purpose, our purpose statement. It answers the question, what's that deep and abiding human need you exist to serve? Well, it's our purpose to be a career accelerator for you, our students, and to be an engine of growth for our community, Cash Valley, for our state, for our nation, and the world. Let me just uh, illustrate these two points uh, with a couple of anecdotes. First of all, I want to tell you about a visit I had from a member of the local chamber of commerce who came to me in the first year I was dean and said, we've got a problem, Dean Anderson. I said, what's the problem? And she said, well, we, uh, our local, our local uh, businesses, as you may know, depend heavily on student labor. And I said, well, yeah, I, I guess I did know something about that. And she said, well, we can't get as many uh, students to sign up as we need. I, say, I, I said to her, well, why do you think that's the case? And she said, well, they're not willing to work for $7 an hour. And I said, you've come to the wrong address. I said, you have to understand something. My job as dean is to help our students increase their wages, not decrease their wages. We want to be a career accelerator for our students. So what we're going to try to do is make your job a lot harder because our students are going to be so valuable and so uh, talented that they won't work uh, for anything close to $7 an hour. Well, I haven't seen her since. Uh, she, she's not been that. Uh, now, what about this idea of engine of growth for the community, the state, and the nation, and so forth? Ask yourself this question, where will Cash Valley be in 50 years? As you kind of look over the valley uh, that we live in, what do you imagine? I can tell you what I imagine. I see us as Switzerland. That's what I see us as. A place where people come to live because it's the place in the world that they choose to live. It's the place that they want to live because it's the finest quality of life that they can find anywhere. And the people who work here are so talented that the work is coming from all over the world to these folks, and they're getting paid very, very high uh, wages. That's the vision that I see for Cash Valley. That's the vision I see for the Intermountain West. Uh, I do not see us as the last pocket of low-cost labor in North America. So I think it's a very different kind of a strategy. And I think the university has a large part to play uh, in that kind of a vision. Now, what's that part so far as the Huntsman School is concerned? Well, you see four key pillars that we're going to focus in on. And we're focusing in on these pillars because we think they are reflective of who you are. And we believe you 
are our defining edge. We believe our students and their core capabilities, aspirations, dreams, and ambitions are the defining, differentiating characteristic of the Huntsman School of Business. First of all, uh, ethical leadership. Most of you come to us, I'm not going to say all, but I would say a very, very high percentage of, of you come to us already with a very, very highly defined set of personal ethics, a sense of right and wrong, and a commitment and a desire to do what is right. Now, we need to help refine that. We need to help you understand how to apply that in your future business careers, because there will be questions and issues that come up for you that you haven't encountered yet, and that you'll need to have a chance to think through before that moment comes to you uh, in life. But we're building off of your great characters. Now that right there, by itself, is a huge advantage, huge advantage, uh, in terms of the, of the workplace. Now I'm not going to say that we are fundamentally different from the students that would go to school and say, Weber State or the University of Utah. Or BYU. Well, maybe BYU. Yeah, but, uh, uh, we're, we're drawing from the same basic population. In fact, I think what we ought to be all about is branding that along, uh, across all of the, of the Wasatch Front. And those of you who have come to us from outside of the state of Utah, <coughs> from different countries, uh, you're part of that as well. We want to brand this as a place where corporations can go to to find ethical, hardworking young men and women to serve in their corporations. Secondly, entrepreneurial spirit. There are many, many uh, studies that have been shown, uh, that have been done by third parties like the Small Business Administration that have identified the Wasatch Front. Let me be broadly, broadly define that from the Spanish Fork to, say, Idaho Falls. Uh, as among the most entrepreneurial sections of the entire country. We regularly show up on top 10 lists uh, in terms of business startups and, and so forth that they use to determine where is the hive of entrepreneurship in the United States. Did you know that, by the way? Did you know that? I mean, it's a tremendously uh, entrepreneurial culture that we have. Now, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, we also have a lot of business failures. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Not enough capital in the startup. Yeah. That's a big part of it. And also, if you take capital and, 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 and develop that concept a little broader, and include things other than financial capital, what would you include? Human capital. Everything. Human capital, resources, experience, and so forth. So what's the role of our university in that regard? to help build that, yeah, help build that capital. So we've got the sort of culture in place for entrepreneurship, but we need to do a better job of helping build the human capital and the financial capital will come that we'll use to uh, be able to, to realize those dreams. How about global vision? Many of you, in fact, we've done some studies, about half of you speak more than one language fluently. That's incredible. That's amazing, actually. Our students speak 24 different languages. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And many of you have lived and worked outside of the United States. Uh, and so you have a sense about the way other cultures work. Well, again, you've got a slice of life. We can add to that and add investments to that through our international programs, like the one that we just recently uh, initiated last summer in Korea, China, and Vietnam or the one that we've got going on now, and it's, uh, it's been through its second year in Chile, Peru, and, uh, and Brazil. These are incredible opportunities uh, for you to invest in yourself. And we're calling the, this the, the Huntsman uh, uh, Scholar Program. Many of you are, are learning about the Huntsman Scholar Program, and are some of you have already applied and been accepted. But you don't have to be a Huntsman Scholar to be able to go on these international trips. Uh, We've got one of our sons went on, on the South America trip uh, two years ago. Uh, and, you know, I guess it's true. Every family has a black sheep. And 
He's a graduate now of BYU, so don't hold it too much uh, against him. But he said to me, Dad, there, I've never been with a group of students that I've had a better experience with. So the students at Utah State University are absolutely outstanding, and it was a great, great experience for him. Uh, our nephew, uh, who's an engineering student, went on the, uh, the Asia program last summer, and he came back completely transformed. I said, what was the, his name's Clark Anderson, some of you may know. Uh, I said, Clark, what was the, the, the most important thing you took away from that summer experience? He said, I realized there's opportunities for me in China, something I had never thought of before. That's what these experiences can do. They can really open up your eyes about both who you are and what the possibilities uh, really may uh, exist for you. Now, the final one is analytical rigor. And why do we mention analytical rigor? Well, it's simply this. You can't succeed to the level that you want to succeed in life without having good quantitative and analytical skills. We want to raise the level, the entire level of, of analytical rigor in this, in this college. And that's what we're committed to do. And we know that if you invest yourself in those efforts, in your math skills, in your statistics skills, in your critical thinking skills, you're going to be able to have opportunities that you would not have available to you if you did not invest in that. So we're going to make a big investment in that area. So that's the strategic framework. That's the framework within which we will make our choices. It's not the whole strategy, but it's a framework within which we will make choices about uh, uh, resource allocation. So I've talked a little bit about uh, purpose. Mission, I mentioned this, top tier in 10 years. Now that is a very big, bold, audacious goal. But remember, we're talking about the niche that we're going to serve in. This is research that was done by Jag Sheff at Emory University. Uh, he looked at many, many different industries, and he said there's an interesting phenomenon. As industries begin to consolidate and regionalize and globalize, what you begin to see is an inverse relationship between profit and share of market up to about 5%. And then you begin to see a direct relationship between profitability and share of market from about 10% any idea why there would be a direct relationship between profitability and size after about 10% of the market share? What's that? More efficient because of scale. Scale. Economies of scale and scope. That's where the efficiencies come from. So that he's articulated what he calls the rule of three. That in, in industry after industry after industry, what you begin to see is a concentration ratio that has three big place, players in it. Maybe one has a 40% market share, another has a 25% market share, a third has a 15% market share. These are the big three uh, in, the, in the marketplace. And then you may see hundreds or even thousands of what you might call niche players. Players where there is true excellence but they don't have large market share. Now, in, if you did the analogy of an educational marketplace, who would be the big three players in business education, would you say, globally? Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, okay? And then you get some debate about it. You know, if you want the next two, would it be London Business School? Would it be Berkeley? Would it be Chicago? Uh, would it be Columbia? Would it be INSEAD over in France? You get some debate about, about that. That's not the marketplace we intend to play in in the next 10 years. We intend to play in this marketplace, a niche marketplace. But there's true excellence in the niche marketplace. My own business, the Center for Executive Development, was in the customized executive education business. It was a niche. Okay? We didn't play in the marketplace with all of the big guys. We had a very, very uh, small niche, but it was a very profitable niche, and it was a very exciting niche to be part of. And that's the kind of thing we're going to go after here with the Huntsman School. We're going to play in a niche. So what is the niche? We're working on that. We're working to define that niche 
very clearly, but I can tell you what some of the elements are already. One is that we want to be a professional school. We want to be a school that prepares people to be job ready when they graduate. We want our employers to recognize us as a place of turning out people who are very, very talented, hardworking, ethical, with a global vision, uh, and have strong analytical uh, 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 skills and capabilities. We also want to do research that matters. We want to focus in on ideas that practitioners can immediately begin to use and build. We want to build our capabilities and our infrastructure because we think our physical environment is a big part of building who we want to be as well. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. And there, we are facing some key strategic uh, choices as we work our way through uh, these elements. I've mentioned the global vision and entrepreneurial spirit, uh, analytical rigor, and uh, ethical leadership. So I want to go straight to the scope. Here's where we're, we're saying this is the, these are elements that our niche is going to focus in on. First and foremost, undergraduate education. We think this is a place where we can build true distinction and true uh, excellence. Your experience as undergraduates is at the core of our strategy and our mission. We will continue to support selected master's degree programs where we can find an opportunity to create uniqueness and distinction. With respect to the PhD program, we're not going to do that. Okay? Not at least in the near term. Uh, in the course of the next 10 years, we're phasing out our PhD programs rather than investing in our PhD programs. Now remember what I said, strategy is about saying no as well as saying yes. Any ideas why we would not uh, put our investment in the PhD program right now? Can any of you suggest any ideas? Could you hear this? The comment was, the number of students that you actually have in your PhD program very, very small, and yet the resources required to support that uh, small number of students, very, very considerable. We're redeploying our resources and focusing it on, on our core mission, undergraduate education. That's exactly right. Um, we are working very hard to integrate students from around the state, however. We have five regional campuses. I'm not sure if you're aware of all this, but Brigham City, Tooele, Uinta Basin, and then we've got uh, 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 regional relationships with uh, uh, Stowe College and also uh, Christ. These students are Utah State University students, and they are a big part of who we are, even though you don't necessarily see them. We minister to them through the regional campus distance education efforts. <coughs> And we're reaching out to them as well. We have a unique position at Utah State University. We have a 101-year tradition of working with all the counties in the state through our land-grant mission. And we intend to use that mission and that 100-year relationship as a distinguishing characteristic in building the excellence of our programs. Executive education is another area that we're going to be investing in. Uh, Shingo, Partners in Business, and the Alliance MBA. How many of you have heard about Shingo? Okay. Quite a number of you have. Let me just, for the benefit of those who haven't, tell you briefly what Shingo is all about. Shejiro Shingo was the uh, genius behind the Toyota production system. He's the guy that really invented and uh, articulated the elements of the Toyota production system that has become known the world over as the very, very best production system. It's often referred to as lean production. He came here to this university in 1988 through the Partners in Business program uh, and received an honorary doctorate. He was so impressed with the students and the faculty and this university that he gave his papers to us and he allowed his name to be used in establishing a prize for manufacturing excellence in his honor, the Shingo Prize which is now known around the world as the Nobel Prize of Manufacturing Excellence. This is a tremendous advantage for us. We're actually now broadening the definition of the Shingo Prize to include operational excellence, so it's not just focused on manufacturing, but also covers the service industries as well. But this gets us entree into, you can't believe how many different companies around the world. We're going to leverage that asset 
make it much more effective in finding opportunities for student internships, <laughs> jobs when you graduate. And in turn, we're going to make operational excellence a bigger part of our curriculum, both at the undergraduate level and also uh, in our master's programs. Uh, finally, the China Initiative. How many of you know that we're currently giving bachelor's degrees from Utah State University to students in China? How many of you know that? Okay. Not very many of you, but we actually do. We're going to graduate something like 100 students a year uh, in the next several years in Beijing and in Jilin City, China. And we're expanding those efforts into a city called Guangzhou, China. These are within some wonderful uh, institutions over in China where we've established long-term relationships. How many of you saw the opening exercise of, of the China, China Olympics? Okay. I mean, were you impressed? I mean, that, that is the future. Now, why are we doing it? Why are we working in partnership with these universities in China? Again, take a 50-year time horizon. First of all, we believe it's a great transformational effort for our faculty. They're going to become much, much better trained in global vision as a result. And if they're better trained in global vision, we think they'll be able to train you better in global vision as well. And these relationships will bring students to us from China. Our students will go over there. Uh, it will be a great transformational experience for all of us. What was the uh, 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 theme of the Olympics? Do you remember? One world, one dream. You know, if there's any place where one world, one dream can become a reality, it's in higher education. It's in universities. And we certainly intend to work to build towards that. What's our advantage? Very quickly, we think it's the sense that I can do that. It's the idea that I can awaken to the possibilities uh, that surround me. When I was an undergraduate here at Utah State University, and I was my parents were living down on the island, I would walk up and back to the campus, and I'd walk down along the boulevard, and I'd look out over the south end of the valley, that incredibly beautiful valley that is still so wonderful uh, all these years later. The thought would occur to me, I wonder if I could live here and maybe work in Chicago. That was as far as my vision uh, could get me in those days. The reality is I had opportunities that my father never had, even though we were in related fields. And I ended up being able to live in Utah and have a business that was a local business. I never actually did any work in the state of Utah from 1989 until I took this job. The rest of the time, I was all that time I was working in, in a global marketplace in, in Europe, in Asia, in South America, of course all over the United States, you will have opportunities that my generation never had. And we can't even imagine what they are. But we, what we can do is begin to get you thinking about the opportunity set that is available to you. I think you live in a world, we live, but I'm talking about you because you have youth and energy and vitality available to you that I no longer have. Uh, you live in an opportunity, a world that is so rich with opportunity, all we have to do is sort of wake up and see it. That's what it's all about. And that's what we will do and work on here at Utah State University. Engage learning. I absolutely fell in love with Utah State the first semester I was here. I had been a, 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 a freshman at Stanford University, then served a mission to my church in Germany. And when I got home from that experience, I was home, uh, homesick and broke, and my parents had moved from California here to Logan, and I thought, well, I'll go to Utah State University for a semester or two, and then when I've got a little more money and not so homesick, I'll go back to Stanford and finish up. I absolutely fell in love with Logan as a place to go to college. And why was that? In part because of the first economics course that I took seated in these seats, not these seats actually, because we re renovated these seats uh, just last year. Uh, but seated in this auditorium, the course I took in Principles of Economics from Green Country, changed my life. Now, I want to just skip forward quickly to some of the other elements that we're building. First of all, part of the capability is leadership. And this year, we've chosen a book for you to read, Positive Leadership by Tim Cameron. He's written all these other books you might want to look up, too. 
but in a moment I'm going to ask Amy if she would tell you a little bit about this assignment. And because we're running out of time, I want to just quickly go to our building the infrastructure question. This is our dream right now. This is the new business building that we want to build where Lund Hall is right now. And we want to integrate it with this building because we need the capacity and because you're working. That's why. That's why we want to build this building. Have you looked around yourself? Have you seen what we've done over the course of the summer? What do you think about that? Do you like it? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Take care of this building, will you? Take care of this building. If you see a scrap of paper, pick it up and throw it away. If there's an opportunity to hold on to a doorknob instead of touch the glass, grab the doorknob. I know these are simple things, but take care of this building. You never know who might be coming in the front door. Just the other day, Cliff Skousen, our senior associate dean, was talking to our janitorial staff about the need to take care of the building because we didn't know what dignitaries might show up. One minute later, the governor and the president came, and they didn't know that they were scheduled to come. It matters. It matters to our ability to raise money. We want to raise $40 million for this. I believe this will happen, but it will happen sooner if we have your help rather than later. Now, with that, I wish we had time for questions. We don't. We need to give Amy a, a chance to, to tell you a little bit about this year's assignment. But I want to tell you something. You kids are great. It's a privilege to be here with you. We're all in this together. Thank you very much.